Ribeyes, New York Strip, Tenderloin, Sirloin, and Chuck. Get your family ready for the chaos at badlandsmedia.tv forward slash no bugs and use the promo code BADLANDS for an additional 10% off your order. That's badlandsmedia.tv forward slash no bugs, promo code BADLANDS. Welcome to episode 59 of Knowledge Based. I'm sorry, 65 of Knowledge Based. We're going to get into a really interesting set of topics. I am doing the show solo tonight, so you're going to have the pleasure of hearing me rant and rave about the things I really like to talk about, which is law, elections, things like this. And particularly today, we're going to talk about something called qualified voting. And if you've never heard of qualified voting before, you're going to be blown away that we don't use these things in our legal and our law systems, certainly in our elections. And we're, I'm also going to get a chance to geek out a little bit and talk to you a little bit about something that I call the omniological process. It's basically a fancy way of anchoring the things that you believe to be true or the models that you create to model reality, which is what our beliefs are, to the most secure thing you possibly can, which is God and the concept of God. So this is one of the things that the founding fathers did, and that's one of the reasons why they not only were able to cut through all the BS that King George was doing, but they were also able to basically learn as much as they could about and manage. Uh, okay, great. Just wanted to make sure I was live uh, and manage the situation of be creating a whole new country, because as a little preamble to this, you know, if if the the king or the ruler or the teacher or the cheater on the schoolyard tells you that the best way to do something is the way he says and you don't know how to actually measure that, you don't know how to, to qualify or evaluate that, you don't know how to judge whether that rule system is actually fair or not, then now you're usually going to be subject to something like that. And certainly when it's a government, we are forced to basically accept the situation as is. And that's exactly the same situation we're in today. We are living in a situation akin to what the Founding Fathers was dealing with, were dealing with when they have started the country over 200 years ago except we got a lot more access to knowledge and information so we can actually make the situation a whole lot better. So um, we're going to get right into it here. So let's go ahead and take a look at the things I prepared today. Now, if, you, um, if you've never heard of some of the stuff I'm, I'm talking about today, then you're going to be hopefully pretty entertained and at the very least inspired and curious. So we're going to talk about, like I said, qualified voting. That's this thing right here. Then we're going to talk about omniology. Now, omniology, that's a concept that um, basically, if you type it into Google, you're not going to find a Wikipedia entry on it because this is one of the most powerful ways to discern information and not only could discern information, but critically think. And then to, with that critical thinking, build something that I've talked about a lot, quite a bit, intrinsic knowledge. So intrinsic knowledge is knowledge that you personally know. If you're, somebody asks you, what is 2 plus 2 equals 4? And all you can do is tell them what you heard from teacher, what you heard from your brother, what you heard from somebody, but you don't really know. You just kind of memorize the answer. Well, that's called extrinsic knowledge. It means the knowledge is outside of you. You don't actually have the knowledge. You've just memorized a fact and you regurgitate it when somebody presses the right button. But intrinsic knowledge is something that you possess. And because of that, you can use it just like a captain on a ship, or you can use it like a lawyer evaluates an argument, or you can use it the way an accountant checks the books of a business to determine if what they were told is actually true or not. So intrinsic knowledge is huge. It might be one of the most important things you know, that we ever learn how to do, and that's why I like talking about it so much and beat the drum about it. And omniology, as we're going to get into here, is... Um, it's a really cool way. It's a theistic way of creating a discernment process that you can use to uh, build a knowledge architecture because, simply put, the truth is one and our knowledge should be one as well. So let me go ahead and take a pop in the chat. I'm running the so show solo, so hopefully everybody likes uh, the new setup here. Let me know if, you, if the sound sounds good, by the way. I'm using a new mic. that We got these mics recently. I've been wanting to get a new mic system for quite some time, as Ryan's who my co-host of uh, you know, um, uh, Vigilant News is keen on saying. And so we've got, hopefully, what sounds like really good quality audio. These, these mics are almost, they basically are an equivalent to what you see 
on Joe Rogan or something like that. Uh, a lot of the podcasters on uh, Badlands or the content creators on Badlands have mics like this. So let me know if you like it. Put a one in the chat if you like the sound. Put a two in the chat if you don't like the sound. And do me a favor and tell, tell me why. Uh, I want to say, give a shout out to all the wonderful Badlanders in the chat. If you're listening live and you're in the Badlands chat, I see you. We got Battle Hamster. We got uh, Lulu, Dawn's Breaking, Maggie Bundle. Uh, who else? Sammy, of course. Sammy, how's it going, buddy? Um, and my beautiful wife, Pink Pearl V. Laying it down. We got Michael Weston. So how's it going, y'all? And of course, Artsy Zone, one of my favorite. Archie Joan, excuse me. <laughs> so uh, much love, everybody. All right, so let's get into this subject. Now, do me a favor. If you have questions, I, hopefully I get some questions because, you know, for me personally, and I know that's like, you know, th this probably sounds, I don't know, kind of silly or something like that, but what we're going to talk about in this show, I think is one of the most important subjects we could talk about to preserve our rights and freedoms, to actually leave the world a better place for ourselves and our children and to end tyranny like there's a, god gave us one of the most powerful swords and weapons that he's ever created and unfortunately the cabal has done such a good job at propagandizing us that we don't actually use it so i'm going to do uh, my best to try to talk about this in a way that's hopefully fun and engaging and interesting um and uh oh for those of you who are curious i'm i'm doing well physically i'm still do you, this thing right here, this is part of my physical appendage that I have to keep on my body until the abscess is fully drained, but I'm doing fine and healthy. I'm basically, you know, back to normal outside of a few issues. So, all right. So, uh, what it, before we get into this, I'm going to talk about the process I use. So, omniology, what is omniology? Well, there's something called epistemology. So, epistemology is the study of knowledge spelled like that epistemology and um oops did i close out of it no i didn't all right and epistemology is the philosophy of knowledge so the philosophy of knowledge is is, is critical it's like if i told you something was true how do you really know it's true well you don't know it's true unless you think about it and as i've been discovering recently there's a whole way of thinking about this where god gave us an incredible thing called the body the flesh and the body can tell you when you need to breathe. It can tell you when you need to eat food. It can tell you when somebody's talking smack behind you and how you should feel a, a desire to defend your reputation and your personhood, because that's important. Um, you know, he can tell you all these things, or it can tell you all these things, but there's some things it can't do. And that's where the will comes in. That's where free will comes in. And free will is designed to work with the body. So all these things we hear about in the Bible about how horrible the flesh is, well, that's only when the will, and I point to both places because it's operating in both places, I would argue, even the Dantian or the gut too, but we'll just focus on these two for now. That's where your, that one of the most important gifts God ever gave us, it's really the only thing we can give back to God because God has everything, right? So it's like, what could we possibly give God? Well, we give him our love. We give him our choice to follow him, to do the will of the Father, as they say. So when we do the will of the Father, as we're going to get into in this episode, we're going to actually engage in the process of defending and protecting our freedoms. And it's about checking, particularly with respect to omniology, it's about fact-checking, thinking critically, which requires an act of will. You cannot discern something to be true by going on autopilot. You have to actually think about what it is that you are trying to discern to be true and then move accordingly. Um, Okay, so the so let's let's get into some stuff here. Um, so what is the qualified voting? So qualified voting is very, to put it very simply, it's that not everybody's vote counts, or to put it even better, it's that only qualified votes count. You know, some people when they hear this, they're like, "Oh my God, how dare you tell me that maybe you know somebody's vote down the road doesn't count." or maybe doesn't count as much as mine. But in, if we boil down this concept in its most simplest form, almost everybody actually agrees with qualified voting. And let's put it simply this way. Do illegal immigrants, should they have the right to vote in our elections? No, they shouldn't. Even though in the current system that we live in, that's exactly what happens. Barack Obama, I don't have the clip right here, but Barack Obama 
on a podcast. Um, it was with the podcast with the with this actress who was in um, a show about how she accidentally got pregnant, and the whole from uh, uh, from a smir- uh, artificial insemination, and the whole show is kind of like a, a, a f- making fun of the concept of. Um, the Immaculate Conception. So, you know, thank you, Hollywood, for that. But anyway, it, in this show, he talks about how if you want to vote as an illegal immigrant, you have the right to vote. Go ahead and vote. I mean, he doesn't say you have the right to vote, at least that, that I recall. But he basically says, yeah, illegal, immig- illegal immigrants can vote, which is dead wrong. And the fact that he even said that, in my mind, disqualifies him from being president and arguably nullifies a lot of the things he did in presidency. But, you know, I have a pretty high standard. So qualified voting is simply that not everybody's vote count or only qualified votes count. So put it in a very simple analogy here. Let's say you're, you're, you've got, you're holding a family meeting and you decide to run your family as a somewhat of a democracy with a pro, you know, executive at the top, the father usually, although it could be the mother, who's going to be like, well, I'm going to take all your votes into consideration, but ultimately, I, because I'm bearing the responsibility for the family, I provide for the family, all these various different things. You know, I have to check and sign off on whatever we vote. And let's say you're trying to determine, well, when should we have lights go out in the family? You know, should the lights go out at 6 p.m.? Should they go out at 8 8 8 p.m.? Should they go out at 3 a.m.? You know, insofar as your children, right? When should the children be going to bed and have lights go out? Well, if you ask all the kids and you ask the parents and you try, you do your best to lay out, like, you know, why this is important, because part of what a good democratic process is all about is that you set some rules for the game what kind of everybody to knows how important playing fairly by the rules is if you want to play a game with somebody whether it's monopoly or basketball or any game what what do you want people to do you want people to play by the rules fairly and you want them to play in good faith meaning that when they play, they're actually trying to play the point and purpose of the game because every game has a purpose and every game has a system of rules to ensure that the players in that game are conforming their behavior to a certain set of standards so that the point of the game itself can come into fruition. So when you think about a legal system or you think about your family or you think about the grand laws, the divine laws that God gave us to run our lives, run our families, run our civilizations, You can think about it just like a game. Categorically, it's almost exactly the same. There's a purpose, there's players or actors, and then there's rules to govern them. And so if you're having a a, a debate with your family or you're casting, you're asking your family, you're taking a poll, that's the right word, you're taking a poll to determine, well, when are we going to have lights go out in in, in our household? You're going to ask your kids, right? You know, maybe your wife's going to say, well, the kids got to get up at, at, you know, 7 a.m. the next morning. So we, we should probably have lights out be no later than 10 o'clock. And then you ask your firstborn, and they're like, you know, the older one, he's in high school, and he says, well, yeah, but probably 10 o'clock's good, but I'd prefer a 10.30. So he's genuinely trying to play the game well. He's, like, actually thinking about it from a practical standpoint. Now, I don't have time to lay out all the ways to create these guardrails around the games that you play when, with respect to the way you run your family or the legal or lawful process with respect to you on your family or the civil process or the organizational process or the business process. These are all different words for the, same, the substance of the same thing, which is that you, everybody's engaged in a pursuit. You're pursuing something. You're trying to do something. And then in order to make sure that everybody's doing this fairly and properly, you're going to have a system of rules to govern that. So let's go, so you have another child. You have to say you have three children. One of them is in middle school. And you say, well, when do you think you should go to bed? And he says, I don't want to vote right now. So I'm like, okay, you know, no problem. We'll move on. Well, right there, you've got a c- kind of a problem. I mean, everybody has free will choice. So if your kid doesn't want to participate, they can abstain or recuse themselves from the vote. But usually that happens for a reason. But I'm just going to skip over that for now. Then you go to your, your six-year-old and you, think, you say, when do you think you should um, go to bed? When should lights go out? And they say, never! Okay, well, should you, as the, the executor or the, the leader of your household, take your six-year-old's vote seriously? Not really. Like, clearly never is not a valid answer. It's not a qualified answer. Why? Well, because there's certain terms and conditions, right? If 
if you're trying to ask your family when should we go to uh, when should we have lights out, answers that fit within the time range of you know let's say you set the time range of 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. If it's not in that time range, then it doesn't count. And with respect to our elections, we already have terms and conditions. You can't vote for non-people. You can't vote for a rock. You can't vote for helium, you know, the element of helium. You can't vote for the Virgin Mary. I mean, you can literally write these things down, but what happens? It's not counted. It doesn't, it's not qualified, and it's not taken seriously. So qualified voting is simply the process of ensuring, just like a referee on the basketball court, make sure that only the shots that were played by the rules are actually going to count, then in a voting system, whether it's a voting system for you and your family, whether it's a voting system for a, a massive election at a national level, like in a country like the United States, whether it's for a business, because you're, you're trying to cast a vote in a committee and you're trying to determine what type of branding decision you should make. They have to fit the standards. It's not anything goes. It's there's a standard, and that standard defines what is really at play, what is going to be a fair vote and what is not going to be a fair vote. So again, we already have something like this in our country. It's called legal votes. And in the last election, what happened? They, you know, just the, the mere mention of the fact that illegals shouldn't be able to, to participate got a lot of people pissed off. Now, the cheaters, the official dumb out there, are smart and they know that they can't really try to contest the idea of illegal votes by explicitly or directly debating that topic because they know they're gonna lose, right? So what they do is they use all these uh, um, evasions to say that the mere qu asking or saying that the legal system requires that only illegal legal immigrants have the right to vote is racist. They'll talk about all these different bad things, poo-poo you for you know, being a white supremacist, for daring to ask a question. But that's, again, that's not a qualified answer. That's not a real answer. If I ask you what's two plus two equals four, and you know, what is the sum of two plus two equals four, and you say, how dare you, you're a racist for even talking about math, well, you, fine, that's a whole other discussion, though. Subject matter matters. <laughs> and when you're having a discussion with somebody, if they refuse to honor the subject matter, then they're in call contempt. And contempt is a concept I would strongly suggest you take the time to understand. Because when you take the time to understand contempt, and not only do you have the power to see when people are throwing bad plays, and you can call foul with respect to our justice system or the... Um, a voting system, but you can do the same thing in all your relationships because ultimately the rule of law is not just a system that applies to you know, our country. It's a system that applies to any interaction between one creature of God and another creature of God. So let's get back to that middle school kid. You know, your middle school kid, he's like, I'm not, I refuse to play. Well, hey, you can do that, but if... Um, you know, that's called contempt, it, meaning that now their will can't be represented in the, the negotiation for who's going to what the bedtime is, which basically means you assent or you, you know, agree to whatever the leader and the executive in that situation is, which is, you know, if I'm the father, then I'm the father then that's in that situation. I'm going to say, well, that's fine. You don't have to participate, but you got to go to bed and I'm deciding that you're going to go to bed at 930. And so it's something like that. All right, so let me, I'm just gonna try to keep an eye on the chat while I'm rambling on here about all this cool stuff. All right, cool. So hopefully you guys find this stuff interesting. Let me ask you, does this make sense what I'm talking about? I'm curious, because I'm actually writing a book about all this right now. And the goal is to have the book out before the election, and that might be asking a little bit too much, but I'm gonna take everything I've learned about the law which is basically, imagine like you, you were at your high school football game and every time you go to the football game, everybody cheats and the cheaters always win. And it's like, man, I, you know, they're not, I know they're not doing something right, but I just can't figure out what it is. And then somebody finds the lost book of the rules of football. And then now you actually can call out the right fouls so that the game could be played fairly. Well, that's kind of you know the point of my book. I want it to be that because, frankly, we are so out of touch with the rule of law, which is the thing that the Founding Fathers discovered so many years ago, which allowed them to create a country and a document that confronted the King of England, King George, and basically told them, you know, get stuffed. We're not going to play your games anymore. 
and we created one of the freest countries in the world. The dream of the freest country in the world, because frankly, you know, we haven't even really gotten a chance to, to play that out right. Okay. All right, so let's continue on here. So what is the omniological method? Man, that is a fancy term. Well, basically, all knowledge has a is linked to all knowledge. So the truth is one. What does the truth is one mean? Well, it's not just a fancy, you know, new age slogan here. It's it's a literal concept. It's part of science, which basically says this. Things that happen over here because they are in the same universe as things happening over here. If I distill a principle from this thing over here and it resembles this thing over here, even if, even if it's not perfectly, then that truth that I distill over here to describe what's happening here should apply over here. So for example, if, um, let's say, I'm trying to think of a simple example for this. Let's say that you slashed your friend's tires and now they can't drive anymore. So what I just described is something called a claim. A claim has certain ideas wrapped up within it. The way we play with ideas in the human world or the human arena is language. What is language? Well, language is a system of sonic symbols that was devised to point to certain categories so that when I say we're taught what happens when, you know, what, what effect happens when a situation in time, you slash your, your friend's tires, that's the action involving a knife the destroying of a tires, what's gonna happen? Well, if you're sufficiently competent with the concept of a car and tires, then you know that you fundamentally change the way that a car works at that point. A car with slashed tires can't really drive anymore, certainly not safely. So if I ask you what happens when uh, you're, you slash your friend's tires, you know, the logical answer is that the, the car can no longer drive. And then if I ask you in another situation, what happens when my, um, my father's tires get slashed? Well, if, it's, if when you slash your friend's tires, it prevents your friend from driving his car, then wouldn't the same thing not hold true with my father and his car? And the answer is yes. So that's called categorical congruency, basically, or principle congruency, or principle coherence. There's a lot of different words for it, but it's very simple. Basically, to use an even more simple analogy, if we have two tables, one table has two apples on it, one table ha uh, and two oranges on it. So this is the table number one, it has two apples and two oranges. And I ask you how many pieces of fruit are on that table? You would probably answer what? You'd answer no four pieces of fruit. And then I have another table. Now there's three apples on that table and there's one orange. How many pieces of fruit do I have on that second table? The answer is four. So the same principles that allow you to derive from that first example, the number four for how many uh, pieces of fruit are in there should congrue or should be applicable to that other piece, that other table. That's the way the universe works. And that's basically the substantive argument or the intrinsic argument behind the truth being one. So what that means is that if, when you take something, you take two examples and you ask yourself, what is the thing that links them? Or how do you know this to be true? you're asking what's something called an epistemological question, which is basically you're asking, well, why is this thing true or not? And what's the argument or what's the, the evidence and the thing that is allowed to, um, to get there? Oh, thanks, Sammy. I'll see, get to that in a second. Um, and the, the why is that important? Because if I, this is called epistemic regress. It's a fancy term for saying how deep down the rabbit hole of ideas can you go before you get to a bottom? So I'll ask you, well, let's go through this as best as I can here. What, let's use the car analogy. Your friend's car's tires were slashed. All right, well, where do tires come from? Tires come from a factory. Where does a factory come from? Factory comes from a person who built the factory. Well, where did a person come from? A person comes from their mother. Where did their mother come from? Their mother comes from their mother. Where did the first person come from? Now we're getting into a pretty, you know, like the fringes of what we can reasonably prove with our, our human knowledge, our material knowledge. Well, the materialists would say, you know, we evolved from dust on the earth and things like this. So we'll go with that. We'll go with that. I'm not even going to invoke a biblical argument, but we're going to get to the same place, which is God. So you might ask yourself, okay, so we evolved from, from microorganisms. Okay, well, where did those microorganisms come from? 
Well, they evolved from particles and atoms that were on the Earth when the solar system was formed. Okay, where did the solar system come from? Well, the solar system came from the, the galaxy and the stars that grew along and over the course of billions of years. Where did the galaxy come from? Well, the, basically the answer, the best answer that modern materialist physicists, and physicists can come up with is there are two answers really, but there's one that gets a lot of, um, gets a lot of attention and that's the Big Bang. So the Big Bang, meaning the whole universe came from this singular creation event where everything that exists right now in the universe was created from a single point or event at some distant point in the past. They say, oh, the last time I, I did any research on this, this was years ago, it was something like 13.8 billion years. So the, that number varies quite a bit. It is not proven despite you, what you might see on the Science or Discovery Channel. Okay, so, well, where did the Big Bang come from? And this is the problem. The, the materialists have no answer. Somewhat recently, they've come up with this idea of multiple universes, which you might say, oh, well, the multiverse, that's where it came from. Our universe is budding up next to this other universe and through the spime interaction, which is a term from string theory, which basically says there's these planes of 10 dimensional motion in space that butt up against each other. And when they collide with each other, you get the creation of a universe. That's the last time I looked into this stuff years ago. That's what the, the current theory was, something in M theory. Then, then you might say, okay, well, where did these 10 dimensional, you know, uh, spimes come from? Or actually, I'm sorry, spime is something else, but in any way, it doesn't matter. Where did these 10 dimensional objects come from that the universe came from? Eh, they don't got an answer. So when you hear the multi-universe theory, the multi as far as I know, the multiple universe theory, and there's a really great guy you can research on this name. Um, I, I think he's a doctor, Dr. Stephen Meyer. He's an intelligent design guy. He, he's really good at epistemology. He's really good at studying science to see if it's valid or not. And he's constantly finding garbage science out there. And there's plenty, trust me. Um, basically, the whole multi-universe theory is something that was invented because when they started to do the evolution, and they were like, well, how much time would it take for a, spe from a single gene to mutate into something that is a new species? The, the amount of time it takes is astronomical. It's something like 10 to the, uh, I think it's 1,6500 power, which is a number that's so obscenely large, there's nothing in the universe that can remotely compare to it. For instance, there are 10 to the 49th, I believe that's the number, 10 to the 49th atoms in the universe. That's a massive amount of number. So if we're talking about 10 to the 1600, that's a number that's like three orders of magnitude larger than 10 to the 49th, which basically means you're, there is no way in hell <laughs> life evolved from random chance. And so the evolutionary theorists at the time were like, oh man, what are we gonna do? We got no way to, to prove our evolutionary theory and they did all, they've done all sorts of patchwork to try to make it work. And frankly, they failed. As far as, I, as far as I'm concerned, as somebody who studies the validity of science, again, epistemology, then, you know, it's like, it's like you're at a, uh, a detective is arguing that a, a person with the ability to time travel who has also six arms, six legs, and can move between dimensions killed this person. Well, it's like, okay, maybe, but you know, that's never happened in human history. You got no evidence to prove it. It's just a glorified theory. Are you gonna take that person seriously or not? Probably not. Okay, so what am I getting to here? Well, the point is, is that there's only one explanation that actually makes sense for where the universe and everything in it came from. And more importantly, where personality came from. You know, where did, where did our ability to find purpose in things come from? Where did our, our rights come from? Where did our desire to have civilizations and have children and, and do right by those children? Where did goodness come from? Where did beauty come from? Where did this thing called truth and desire to know it come from? Well, the materialists have no answer, okay? But there is an answer. And you know what the answer is? It's God. It's something called the ontological singularity. So when you hear about ontology, it's categories basically what a category does is it it says there's these things out there called squares to use an example and squares are things that have four sides that are joined by a 90 degree angle 
then there's other things called circles. Circles are a, a, a curved object that is totally uniform in the outside. Well, if you ask yourself, what are the categories that link those two things, right? Because the, thing, the way to describe a square means that you're not talking about circles, you're only talking about the things that fit the square shape, like a pane of glass, like, um, uh, I forget the, the name for those square wrenches and tools, but anyway, you get what I'm saying. Well, the category that fits them both is called a shape. And so when uh, ontology is a study of categories, it's the way that we describe one thing, the way we describe another, and the whole system of categories we use to group that and link it together. So the ontological singularity is the category of categories, the ultimate category, the category where all other categories come from. And that is, it's a concept that's equivalent to God. That's what the ontological singularity is. So it's basically a fancy way of saying is when you ask the where did this come from, where did this come from, where did this come from question, you only end up at one reasonable place philosophically. Now, the, from a scientific perspective, if you really care about the truth and you're asking these questions and there's really only one theory that you ever come up with, don't you think you'd want to honestly study it and follow it? Well, unfortunately, that's not the case. We got a lot of people who utterly refuse, who do not have what I call intellectual integrity, which is, uh, that's actually a term from epistemology, by the way. And what it basically means is that, you know, you hear about all these things that, that scientists, if you ever flip on the science uh, channel, they talk about these theories and these equations and all this fancy math, E equals MC squared. Well, you know what E equals MC squared is? It's a categorical model of reality. So in the You'd think that if anybody would be able to honestly evaluate whether or not a, a theory of everything, meaning a theory of God, was valid, it'd be people who know how to deal with categories. But you've got a little contempt going on in the field of science right now, people who refuse to play the game fairly. All right, so to close this section off, and then we're going to get actually into the meat and potatoes of this discussion tonight, omniology is... It's a, it's a philosophic method and, and an epistemological method that I came up with. And do, my, do I think I invented it wholesale? No, I'm sure many people have come up with it. As a matter of, fa matter of fact, I think the founding fathers came up with it. I know for a fact that Stephen C. Meyer uses a, a system that's very similar. And I know for a fact that um, many other honest theist, uh, theistic scientists come up with it. So when I say theism here, I'm not talking about the Bible. I'm not talking about Christianity. I'm not talking about... Islam, I'm not talking about Buddhism, I'm talking about the category that groups all those things together, which is the concept of a creator, specifically a personal creator, a creator that is all-powerful, all-wise, all-knowing, and all-purposeful, a creator that created everything, it created the entire universe, it created us, it created the purpose of the universe, and it created the rules through which the universe, the laws uh, through which the universe runs and governs. That's what theism is, and that's what the Founding Fathers discovered. They th use their critical thinking in a beautiful way that anybody can do, because I'm, you know, I'm not that all that smart, to be perfectly honest with you. So if I can come up with it, you, you, know, you know other people can come up, up with it. And basically what it says is that, well, there is religion here which says very specific things, and I can kind of build a law system on top of that, or a ph philosophic system that models things, which is what a law system is, but... If I come up with a grander system, then I can get these two people that hate each other to not hate each other as much. And that's what theism is. That's why it's so powerful when you create a law system. Because ultimately, all law, one of the secrets of law I learned over the years, and it's very simple. A law system is, is founded on something that we all have, which is knowledge. If I was to ask you, what are the rules that govern your house? You probably would be able to tell me, well, the, the trash comes on Wednesday and you know, I got to pay the electric bill. So there's all these things that are happening in your universe that is your house. Your knowledge of that, your accurate knowledge of that, allows you to build a system of laws. What is the system of laws? Well, it says, if this, then that. Meaning, if you stop paying for the electric the electricity, what's going to happen? That cause is going to produce an effect. You're not going to be able to turn your lights on. If you turn the faucet on and you plug the sink and you walk away for 10 days, what's going to happen? It's going to flood your bathroom. So everybody uses this, this principle of knowledge plus understanding equals law. 
meaning you have a system that you can use to predict and govern the behavior in your world. And when other people agree on that system, meaning when everybody in your house says, did you pay the electricity bill because you know what happens if we don't, then they're operating in a system where they acknowledge all of the, the, the knowledge, so they have shared knowledge. From that shared knowledge, they have a shared law system. And from that shared law system, they can build trust, they can build law and order, they can build beneficence or goodness, or they can produce prosperity, okay? And that's what it's all about. So when we say we're using, when I say I'm using the process of omniology, I'm saying I'm, you, all that stuff that I just talked about, about how to link concepts using philosophy and critical thinking, I, when I do my, my research, especially when I'm doing research like I'm writing in this book, I'm going to anchor everything I'm saying to the, the hardest foundation that has ever been discovered, which is the theistic concept, the concept of God. And that's exactly what we're about to go through when it comes to what qualified voting here in a minute. All right. So before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and pull up our, uh, sorry, I guess I got to do this all on my own here. So let me see, where is that? Why isn't it working? Oh, it's because <laughs> that's not the right one. All right, so let's move over to this. So we're going to hear from one of our amazing sponsors. Thank you so much, everybody, for participating in supporting uh, Badlands Media through supporting our sponsors. Are you ready to diversify your assets with Bitcoin? Introducing River, the official Bitcoin partner of Badlands Media, where you can navigate the world of Bitcoin with confidence. With River, you can buy Bitcoin like a pro with the assurance of being licensed and regulated right here in the United States. River ensures your Bitcoin journey is smooth and secure with on-demand live support at your fingertips. River empowers you to grow your portfolio without any unwanted surprises and eliminates third-party custodians putting your, you in control of your assets. Open an account with no premium purchase requirement. You can get your Bitcoin journey started with just $1. Visit badlandsmedia.tv forward slash river to create your river account today. That's badlandsmedia forward slash river. River shaping the future of finance with one Bitcoin at a time. Did you do you have a comms plan with your loved ones for when the cellular grid goes down? If the cost of complexity of radio feels like feels overwhelming, Radio Ready is your answer. Red, oh, sorry, Ready Radio. Ready Radio arrives at your door pre-programmed and ready to go. These Bofang 2 Way radios are reliable devices procured programmed to your specific area and shipped by an American First flam, American First family in Montana. You could spend thousands of dollars and countless hours just dip your toes into ham radio. But that's, not a f but that's not feasible if you're just looking for a simple backup communication source when there is no other option. Get, a radio, get ready radio for every member of your doomsday crew by going, by going to badlandsmedia.tv forward slash ready. Enter promo code BADLANDS to save 10% on your purchase. Note... An FCC license is not required in an emergency. That's badlandsmedia.tv forward slash ready, promo code BADLANDS. Yeah, I wanted to take a minute and talk about this because this is really cool. First of all, um, let's do the Bitcoin one first. Yeah, Bitcoin is really awesome, guys. If you haven't had the chance to do it, watch uh, G Money show with Patriots in Progress. And they have a lot of cool things to say about it. I don't necessarily agree with all of it, but I definitely agree with the fact that having a uh, financial medium that allows you to transmit value from one person to another without the government crawling up your butt is a really good thing, and it empowers us in a very powerful way. That's why they do it. That's why they use these cryptocurrencies and other forms of currency to transact free from government you know, scrutiny, things like this. And the other thing is 
you know, radio, having the ability to communicate is critical. I have my own personal little radios that I got for my family because of when the 2020 thing was going down, I was like, I am not going to trust my government to necessarily protect me in these situations. I need to communicate with my wife. I need to communicate with the other people that I live with in the, the vigilant news compound. And so, you know, we're all, we're all patriots, we're all truthers, and we know how crazy things can get. And I strongly suggest you look into these things because they are legitimate. All right, everybody, let's switch back over to the uh, show today. So what I'm going to do, I was going to turn this into a uh, mind map, but I just didn't have the time to make it happen. So I'm going to flip this over here. We're going to move this here, and I'm going to format this. Uh, let's see, double space so we can see it. So what I've built you here is an ontological tree, which basically means this. When I get down to qualified voting, you're going to have all of these links or links in the latter or chain that allow you to understand why this concept is valid. Now, it's philosophically coherent. What does that mean? Well, for the same reason 2 plus 2 equals 4, if you, it, that's called meth, um, that's a mathematical system. So what a mathematical system is, is a system where you can assign the things in reality a symbol. And as long as the symbols are properly defined, then you can predict reality with that symbol so perfectly in this case that we can basically use mathematics to create some of the most crazily, amazingly beautiful things and effective things in our reality. I mean, if it wasn't for math, I wouldn't, you wouldn't be hearing my voice right now. All right. So let's see if we can get through this. I got about 20 minutes to work with. So first point, there's God. This is the absolute foundation, the ontological, ontological singularity, meaning we can't go further than God. God exists. God, his will, is to pursue excellence. So God's had, God has a will, and then next, or there's God, and then God has a will, and that will is to pursue excellence. Well, what does that mean? Be ye perfect, even if your God in heaven is perfect. I think it's Matthew uh, 6, 8 or something. Let me see if I actually look it up. Matthew, be ye perfect. There we go. Matthew five forty eight. Be ye perfect, therefore, as your Father in, hev in heaven is perfect. This is one of the most powerful phrases that's in the Bible because it literally tells you what God's will is for us. It's to be perfect. Well, what does perfect mean? Well, it basically means to pursue the best things. The word we use for that is excellence. So I'm actually going to copy this. Uh, actually, there's a version I like. Uh, yeah, here we go. I personally like the King James version of this. They're all pretty good. And we're going to paste that right in here. Put that, we're going to make this a little smaller. I'm going to put it right under there. Be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So God wants us to pursue the best things. What does that mean? Well, it means, what it, again, because you can boil all this down into a game. If you're playing the game of breathing properly, then what are you going to do? Well, when you feel the need to breathe, you take deep, good breaths that oxygenate your body so that you can think clearly, so that you can have the energy you need to do things. If it comes to the game of eating, what's, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to eat food that's healthy, that's not filled with poison, and that is going to nutrate your body perfectly because your body is a machine. And what do you need to do for any other machine? You need to do certain things to it to preserve that machine so it can work the way you want. So when we talk about pursuit of excellence, that's one of these uh, omniscopic or universal principles. Everywhere in the universe you look, you're going to find the pursuit of excellence. You can't avoid it. As a matter of fact, if you try to avoid it, then you get mediocrity. You get a world like we're living in today where, you know, it's like, well, I don't really want to show up to work on time. So that means the business I work for suffers and the quality is going to suffer considerably. Or yeah, I could, you know, not cheat on my wife because that's the whole point of marriage. It's literally written in the, the vows we take almost in every marriage ceremony on earth. But I'm going to go ahead and watch porn, and I'm going to go ahead and, you know, have sex with a neighbor. Well, you're, you're, what are you going to get from that? I can guarantee you it's not going to be a good marriage. It's like, well, I could be nice to my kids, and I could try to educate, educate myself about how to raise my kids. 
or I could sit around watching prices right all day long and do nothing, neglect my kids, cause them issues. Now, because they're neglected, they're going to suffer profoundly in life because it turns out neglect is worse than sexual abuse when it comes to psychological damage. And now not only do they have to suffer, but you have to suffer because you have to deal with it. And then the world suffers because now there's somebody who's not working it properly, you know, psychologically in the world. So pursuit of excellence is huge. And arguably the biggest pursuit of excellence when it comes to human beings is civilization. The grand game of trying to do God's will in all the different ways that you have to do as a person is within your family, within your job, within civilization. So civilization is the, the garden of Eden, the walled garden that we create, human beings create. And that's where our will, that's what when you hear the word dominion in the, uh, Genesis, that's referring to the place where man's will operates. And that's civilization right there. So excellence is huge. Excellence seeking or excellence leads to certain things. Well, what happens when you pursue excellence? Well, then you, you get something awesome, which is truth, beauty, and goodness. So seeking or embodying truth, this is how you do it. You know, how do you pursue excellence? You might be wondering, well, I'm going to tell you right now. First, you need to seek the truth. Right, Because if you're trying to pursue excellence when it comes to brushing your teeth, teeth and you don't even acknowledge the concept of teeth or brushing or toothpaste or what, all these different things, then are you going to be able to do a good job at it? No. So the first thing you need is knowledge. You need knowledge. Just like I was talking about before, you're trying to run a good house, you want to make sure the electricity is going to stay on, your toilets work, all these wonderful things that we have in modern civilization. What do you need to do first before you do anything? You need knowledge of these things. And that requires an act of will. You have to actually try. It's not just going to come to you magically. You have to use your attention, at tension, at ten, which is an old Egyptian reference to, you know, being present, basically. Uh, so you need to seek the truth. And embodying the truth, the reason I have it slashed here is that it's not just about seeking the truth. It's about living that truth that you believe to be true. Now, because humans are limited in knowledge, we're omniscient, that doesn't mean you're going to get it right the first time. You're going to have to try. And that is itself a pursuit of what? Excellence. The better you are at embodying the truth, the better you're able to live that truth, the better you're literally able to link with reality. So, you know, when you see expert basketball players or phenomenal uh, poker players or anyone that does something well, that person has taken the time through their will to seek the truth and embody that truth because they can actually interact with this other thing, this other activity, and do it well enough to do it well, to do it a good job, to do it excellently. All right, so what happens when you do things excellently? Well, it creates an effect. You know, that's the cause. The cause is seeking truth. And then when you act on it, that is also a cause. Well, what happens when you act on that truth? You create beauty. It's a garden, right? So what happens if you want to understand all the different organisms in your, your local environment? Let's say you live in Georgia like me, and you're like, man, look, what is all these different things? We got trees, we got you know, ants, we got all these different organisms. What is the best way to make harmony out of all these things? Well, if you f follow the truth wherever it leads, and that's part of seeking, what are you going to get? You're going to get a beautiful garden. You're going to get a beautiful life. Same thing with pursuing the excellence of eating well and being physically fit. What are you going to get? Well, I can tell you what I like, you know, <laughs> is, you know, p most people tend to like beautifully fit people. Now, if you're not, I'm not poking fun at you or anything like that. But I'm just saying that, like, let's just be honest about the situation. When you pursue good, when you pursue the truth, then then act on that, you create beauty. Beautiful things to usually come about from that. And then what happens with beauty? Well, beauty is like an external source of inspiration. And what does that do to the person who's surrounded by beauty? Well, I can tell you the reason if you go into a prison cell, they don't make prison cells bland and drab and filled with cinder blocks for, because they think they're beautiful. They do it because of the opposite. You know, They think they're ugly. And they've, there's this whole, uh, I think it's called brutalism. There's this whole type of architecture called brutalism, which is specifically designed to to demoralize people. And that became popular sometime in the, I think it was the 50s and 60s when it really started to take off. So anyway, you get truth, you get beauty, and you get goodness. That's what happens. And has anybody ever heard that phrase before? All right. So 
with God. First, you have God. Let's go back here to the beginning. We got God. We got God's will. And what does God want to do with his will? He wants to seek or pursue excellence. So what happens? Well, he creates a place where pursuing excellence can happen. You know, if you, you've ever heard of any creation, um, you know, philosophic creation myths, not necessarily the creation myths of like, you know, and God moved over the face of the waters. Oh, that, that's kind of it. It's in there. But one that's a little bit more like modern, quote unquote, is where God, in order for God to experience his own beauty and his own perfection, he needed to create a illusion or a dream world or a place where something that isn't him can actually operate. And that's the creation. So this is where excellence is pursued, meaning you're not, you're not becoming a better basketball player by take, sleeping all day long. You're becoming a basketball player by going to the place where basketball is played. You're not becoming a, uh, we're not becoming a better civilization by tuning out and playing video games all day because that's not the place where civilization goes to become excellent. You need a public square for that, and then you need other things in order to, to get that civilization to become perfect. All right, so you have a place. You have the place where a game is played, which is the creation. You've got these rules and a point, which is the, this is the purpose, to pursue excellence. This is the place where the pursuit of excellence happens. And then you got what? Well, you need actors. You need players in the game. You need people who are going to try to do these things, right? And that's man. God's child and trustee in training. So what does that mean, trustee in training? Well, I'm probably not going to get a chance to touch on it too deeply because I need to get to the qualified voting thing. But basically, it's that when we finally figure, where you finally figure your stuff out, you know what happens? You get to actually participate in, 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 in affecting God's will on earth. I mean, we do this anyway. Anytime you're a good person, anytime you do things excellently, you're actually doing what God wanted you to do. And that means you get to act as God would act in the creation. That's part of the, what Jesus modeled for us, you know, 2,000 years ago. So what is man's purpose then? To circuit it all back. It's to pursue excellence. You know, you're, we're here to be good to each other, to seek for truth, create beauty, and be good people. That's what we're here to do. You know, to pursue true, uh, what is it? Pursue happiness is one of the ways that the founding fathers described it. So if you're using your critical thinking brain and you're like, what is the substance of what the founding fathers talked about and the substance of the purpose of life? Well, ding, 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 ding. You are right on the right track because they're the same thing. Uh, man's excellence. So what is man's excellence? Let's, we got to get this down. So we've said that the purpose of life is the pursuit of excellence. We said that we have a creation where we can do that. Well, the, the playing field where man does that is civilization. And a civilization is basically the place where two or more people go and interact with each other. All right. And so there's a, every time you do something, you affect everybody else on the planet, whether you like it or not, you know, and the, although the effect might not be as apparent, it's way more apparent or that it's easier to see when you're living with another person. If you're married, I guarantee you there's things that you're gonna get negative effects by doing some things and you're gonna get positive effects by doing some things. Conversely, you're gonna get negative effects when you don't do some things and you're going to get positive effects when you don't do some things. But basically, without getting too detailed and nuanced on this one, this is the, the purpose of man. So what is man supposed to do? We're supposed to be maximizing beneficence or the benefits that we create through our being. God gave us these rights. God gave us this body. God gave us this voice. God gave us the ability to see. He gave, all, gave us all these tools. Well, what are tools for? They're for building things. They're for creating things. And then we get to enjoy that benefit. By the way, a lot of the stuff that you're seeing here was roped into Freemasonry. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, Freemasonry is great, hardly. But what I'm saying is that the cabal, one of the ways that they manipulate it and they trap people is they take really deep truths and then they package them in a form that they can use to manipulate people with. That's exactly what's happening now in our modern media. But anyway, so you're maximizing beneficence. You're trying to create the, mo create the most benefit possible, right? When you're a farmer and you want to you know, have a really successful year as a farmer, what are you doing? You're trying to grow quality food as abundantly as possible, right? You're trying to create prosperity, to put it in American terms, I suppose. So what's the other thing you're doing? Remember, because there's things you want to do in a marriage. There's things you have to do to do, create goodness, and there's things you should definitely not do to create goodness. 
You need both of those things, right? So that's kind of like the yin yang of this. Well, it's minimizing harm and fruitless suffering. So what a minimizing harm, what do I mean? What does that mean? Well, when you take action in the world, you, what's gonna happen? You're gonna affect somebody. If you decide at three in the morning, if you're in your house and your family is there and your wife and your kids are there, you're gonna, you're gonna pop in the, the A track and start playing, you know, uh, I don't know, um, the Kiss concert from the 1980s at the loudest volume you possibly can, that's gonna have an effect, right? You might be creating prosperity for yourself in that moment, a benefit, because you're gonna enjoy the music, but that's gonna have a negative effect on the people around you. They're not gonna be able to sleep. So when you harm others, the most general way to think about harming others is to violate their rights. So when you honor somebody's rights, you minimize harm. That's the way it works. And fruitless suffering. So fruitless suffering is, you know, we can't help but suffer. Despite what some people think out there, the more new agey types, so you can't, suffering is a part of life and you have to acknowledge it. And as a matter of fact, fruitful suffering is really, really a powerful, amazing thing. When you work out, when you can do exercise, you're engaging in fruitful suffering. And that, these are these things that take will. You know, when you use your will to be like, sorry, body, I'm not gonna drink a ton of alcohol today, or sorry, body, I'm not gonna eat all those Twinkies today. Sorry, body, I'm going to, uh, not going to eat McDonald's today. I am going to work out. I am going to do exercise. I am gonna do that cold dip. I am gonna go into the sauna. These are things that are not necessarily all that comfortable. They create a kind of suffering. You know, I think it's reasonable to say that. You know, certainly when you're, you jump into a cold ice bath, you know, where there's literally ice floating in the water and the water's like 30 to two degrees, you're gonna feel something that we usually call painful. And that's a type of suffering. But it's fruitful because it helps you. It creates an objective benefit. It, they create, you approach a value that is linked up with the ontological singularity. And anytime you do that, you're, you're expressing the values of God through the values of man by pursuing man. And that's something you create. Basically, you join the two wills together. It's, again, somewhat esoteric there. but So fruitless suffering is the opposite. When you get all the suffering and there's no benefit to it, you know, um, Kicking the, the nerdy kid in the groin on the, the schoolyard is fruitless suffering. Yeah, it's pain, but it's not necessarily doing him much good. Now, interestingly enough, God's creation is so beautiful and so perfect that in almost every instance I've ever examined in my life where I'm trying to find totally and completely fruitless suffering, there's still something there that's valuable and has some kind of benefit. You know, So that's a deeper discussion. I'm just going to keep moving forward. So uh, I forgot to put this here, but... Um, Civilization. So civilization, what are we doing with civilization? Well, there's some things we should do with civilization that are pretty awesome. And when you, uh, when you act on these things in civilization, you get beneficence, you pursue excellence, you make the world a better place, you minimize harm and suffering, you do God's will. And that's kind of the whole point, whether you like it or not, you know, it's kind of like playing a game. You might not want to play the game, but once you're in the game, you're in the game. If anybody's ever taken a psychedelic before or, you know, went on a roller coaster before, wh whether you like it or not, if you're on that roller coaster and it's going, you know, about to take off, you better b buckle down and tr do your best to use your will to embrace the, the experience you're about to have. Because when you do that, you get all these beautiful psychological effects through something called the Xiphoid nucleus or process that transmutes all that anxiety neurochemicals into pleasure chemicals. All right, uh, oh shoot. All right, thank you about that, please. Or I appreciate that. Apparently I had not switched the screen over. All right, so here, this is what I was just blathering on, not showing you all this beautiful stuff that I was talking about here. But anyway, that's that. Apologies for that, everybody. We're going to move on to the civilization tree here, which is linked to this. Because remember, what did I just do? I created an ontological framework that links God, right? You got this one here. This is God and all the things that come from God. So that's that ontological singularity or the absolute foundation. And then that leads to this which is civilization. So now we're gonna get, go from civilization, as we're just building, we're going up the ladder, I like to say, even though we're moving down the page, we're going up the ladder to um, qualified voting. So first, we got trust. What's trust? Well, trust is really important. It's arguably the framework of everything. When you are honest, 
and you are dutiful, you create trust. When you, you tell your, when you borrow your friend's car and you tell him, and he tells you, hey, just make sure to have the car back by uh, 6 p.m., then you're, you, and you actually do it, and then you tell him, hey, man, sorry, but somebody, you know, banged into the, uh, um, the door, the car door, and I accidentally, you got there's a dink on your car. I'm sorry about that, a ding on your car. Well, you're being honest, and you're creating, you're honoring their, your duty, which is the do to things you said you would do. And what happens when you do that? Your friend trusts you more. You get this thing called trust, and trust is the bedrock and foundation of all human relationships, including civilization. So honor is duty plus humility, which equals goodness. So what does that mean? Well, when you honor something, you are honest about it and you do your duty about it. And on, honor also means humility, meaning, you know, if, if something, let's say that you uh, set your alarm to wake up to go to, to school that day and an EMP went off or not something that crazy. Let's say you plugged in your phone to charge it, but for some reason the, the cable wasn't plugged in all the way and your phone didn't charge, which means it died overnight, which means your alarm didn't go off. Well, you could be like, oh, no, no, it's not my fault. And to be sure, it isn't really your fault necessarily, but you miss the learning opportunity if you don't acknowledge what could happen, which you could have done something in that situation. What is, could you have done? You could have checked to make sure that the thing was plugged in before you sat down and went to bed. So that's what humility is all about. And when you combine duty and humility, you get goodness. You get good people, people who are honest, like, hey, man, I borrowed your car. I mean, I didn't mean, I didn't intend for this person to open the door and ding your, your passenger side door, but it happened. And I'm going to be honest about it, and I'm going to tell you about it because that's the humble thing to do. Uh, tripartite agreements. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this one, but basically every agreement that exists is a tripartite agreement, meaning God sent you into the world with certain tools he used his will to give, create a body for you, to, to loan you a body, I should say. He loaned you a body. He loaned you a mind. He loaned you as part of his free will. He loaned you a soul. He loaned you all these different things. And that means he's going to benefit from the agreement, right? Because he created the universe for, for a reason, right? What did he create the universe for? He didn't create it for no reason at all. He created it because he had himself is invested in the game to pursue excellence. At least that's one way to look at it now. I mean, we can't see things from God's perspective entirely, but that's certainly part of it. So these things here leads to contracts. So contract is God's gift to man to do his will. It is the most powerful technology that exists. It has ever existed and will ever exist. Why do I say that? Because anytime you do anything, you're engaging in a contract. But there's two types of contracts. There's honorable contracts and there's dishonorable contracts. An honorable contract is something that uses these two principles, trust and honor. A dishonorable contract, when you execute a dishonorable contract, like you cheat on your wife, you damage the trust between you and your wife. You, that's called bad faith. It's like cheating, okay? Um, all right, so contracts, if you ever heard of something called the social contract, you know what the Constitution is? It's a contract. That's what it is. It's a place where two people who have free will, well, more than that, a bunch of people who have free will, but all you need in order for to create a contract is two or more people. Use their will to create a, a, a place where they're going to actually work together to try to do something, because a contract has a purpose, just like a game. What are you playing the game for? It's for a reason. What kind of players do you want in the game? Players that are honest, that um, are, are able to be trusted, and have honor, meaning that you can actually work with them and they're going to do what they say they're going to do. And they're actually going to honestly pursue the purpose of the game. So that's what a contract is. So civilization is a contract between men and God, meaning we, we create a civilization. As a matter of fact, the substance of a civilization is exactly what you have between you and your wife if you're married. Or you and your girlfriend if you, if you have a significant other. They're the nucleus, or if you think about physics, right? You know, what is the smallest possible thing that we can get with respect to uh, atoms? Uh, or, <laughs> yeah, I just gave it away. It's atoms, meaning that, yes, you can boil it down to um, particle physics and all this kind of stuff, but don't let anybody hear this, tell you, tell you this, but they've never actually discovered a single electron before. They've discovered things like protons and neutrons, but they never actually discovered a single electron. 
So without getting into that whole discussion, the, the smallest unit or building block when it comes to physics is an atom. And when it comes to civilization, the smallest unit is two people. It's a marriage, because a marriage is what a much better expression of this kind of grand tripartite principle. Because a marriage, you're doing things, something for each other. You're doing something for the big guy upstairs. And then that does what? It creates something. That's why a marriage between two men, I don't really call a marriage. I know that's not PC, but it isn't, because it cr doesn't create anything. Now, is it not beautiful? Is it not amazing? No, sure. But the words matter, and we create categories for a reason. And we shouldn't apply the same word to a situation that, has ca that is categorically different. All right, so in order for civilizations to work, because they require free will, you need, you know, what happens when you get into an agreement with your wife? You need to cast a vote. You need, she needs to ask you, do you want to go out to dinner Tuesday night? And you either say yes or no. Well, when you say yes or no, you vote. Elections is the process of selecting the best person possible. So when you're in, with respect to our government, you know, we are electing or we're choosing a person using our free will or our vote to do a job. And for the same reason, you're, if you're going to hire a contractor to fix your roof, what are you going to do? You're going to interview maybe a few candidates. You're going to try to find somebody who's the best that embodies certain qualities, like honesty, like duty. Like, are they going to show up or are they just going to leave you high and dry and take your money? These kind of things. And you're going to try to do somebody who's done the, a good job. If you interview a candidate to fix your roof and every roof he's done for the past 10 years has collapsed after a year, are you going to pick that guy? Probably not. So your votes, Matt, the, the votes to, with respect to choosing a candidate to do something, to elect or select something, is part of what civilization is all about. So voting, uh, so that's how we build civilizations, by the way. So voting is man's will in the creation, or man's will in the garden. What is the garden? That's the place where, you know, I'm not saying the garden of eating, because that's the place where, um, uh, God's will exists, but also it's a place where a man's will existed for a little bit because God gave Adam and Eve certain directions. I mean, they didn't last too long. They screwed it up pretty quickly, but there was a point where God was literally reaching down and being like, hey, I want you to help me manage this thing called the garden, and we could have had the opportunity to do it, but we blew it, or at least this is the, the story from the Bible and many other um, creationist um, religions like the Sumerians, they had their own version of it that was very similar to the Bible. But in any case, so the, the garden is civilization. It's the place where man's will has dominion, and voting is a part of that. So what is qualified voting? We're finally here. And qualified voting, just like we were talking about with um, uh, t the kids going to, to sleep, when are we going to have lights go out? It's the, th the system by which we qualify or measure the quality of a vote. You know, should a person's vote matter when they're not really playing the game fairly? Well, if, on a basketball court, if somebody shoots a, uh, a ball when the clock isn't running, does that point count? Does that ball tr generate a point that then makes the, p the team gains more points for the team? No, it doesn't. Um, in your family, if, uh, if you're asking a question about where should we go to dinner, and one of the people in your family says, you know, your kid says, well, I don't want to eat dinner at all. Well, you know, again, that might be just something he doesn't want to do, but that doesn't decide that question, that answer is outside of bounds. It's outside the boundary you use to create the, the answer, uh, the consensus around what should actually happen that night as far as dinner is concerned. So when it comes to qualified voting, there's many different types of qualified voting. Uh, depending if Jordan's here next week, um, he might not be. Uh, it, I will do a whole episode on qualified voting, and we'll get into a lot of really interesting things. Um, but just briefly, qualified voting is when... Um, here, one second. In a civilization, it's pretty simple. Like I said, we already have a system of qualified voting. I can't vote in California elections because I'm living in Georgia. So boom, we already got qualified voting. So if you ever talk about qualified voting and people are like, oh my God, you're trying to disenfranchise people. You're trying to take people's votes away. Just be like, what are you talking about? We already have a system of qualified voting. We just need to improve it. Because right now it's so out of whack. It's so crazy. 
that our elections can be stolen and rigged, just like they were in 2020 and just like they have been for a very long time. You know, uh, an interview I strongly suggest everybody to watch is the Mike Benz and Tucker Carlson interview, because basically what he says is that we have not had a free election at least since the creation of the CIA. And do you really think they just figured that out back then? Hell no. Every election we've had, arguably in human history, has been manipulated, or at least people thought about manipulating it in some way, but to not get too grandiose. Certainly every election since the start of this country, there were people behind the scenes, and maybe even the public, that were trying to manipulate the situation. So qualified voting is the system we use to measure the accuracy of somebody's votes. And when it comes to a presidency, it's, it's simple. What is the point of the game that we call an election when it comes to a presidency? Well, we're trying to put somebody in office who's qualified or capable of doing a good or excellent job, right? They're not going up there to represent you know, some minority. You're, you're putting them in there because you need them to do a job. There's things that need to happen, just like it for when it comes to a family, right? Like if I'm a father, God willing, I will be soon, and I'm trying to have a family, you know, there's things I got to do. There's responsibilities. There's like a, a ship is another great analogy, by the way. On a ship, you'd say you got a ship of 100 people. Well, everybody has a job, and if one person doesn't do their job, what happens? The quality and the, the potentially even the livelihood and the, the lives of everybody on that ship could be put at risk. People could die or suffer needlessly. That's how serious this is. This is a narrow path situation, meaning there's, there's a tiny little path of what we should be doing that makes it right, and then there's these oceans of screwing it up that we got on either side of that path. So we wanna put a president in office that can actually do a good job. I don't know about you, but I don't think the resident in the White House is doing too good of a job right now. I think he's, well, there's a lot of things I could say about what he think, but you know, I think I'm getting the point across here. You do not want to put somebody in office who doesn't know how to do a good job. If you're having an election, if you're having a referendum on what bridge we should build to get from one point of, you know, uh, one side of a river to another in a, in a city, you want, and you're trying to figure out a contractor, you're going to do what? You're going to try to do a good job of picking that contractor, somebody who's qualified, somebody who knows what they're doing, has demonstrated their ability to do it properly, is not going to pilfer and overcharge you, and these kind of things. Well, same thing with the president. So, now this is the key. What happens when somebody casts a vote because they don't like one of the candidates? Is that Does that count as a vote? You know, let's say that we're having a contest with a bridge, and person A, or Jim, doesn't like the guy who designs the best ship or the best uh, blueprint for uh, a bridge. And he's like, you know what? Even though that's the best one, F you, I'm voting for this other one. Does that count? Well, I mean, so a lot of people will say, yes, it absolutely counts, and you, how dare you not you know, acknowledge that person's vote. For me, for perfectly honest with you, it doesn't count. And you know why? It's because good faith is important. If you're having a voting system and you allow people to vote for all sorts of silly reasons, like, you know, I don't like Donald Trump, well, the main, what's the purpose, again, of the voting? The purpose of the voting is not to put anybody with a pulse in the, the office of the presidency. The purpose of the voting is to find the best person, which means you have to, in good faith, and good faith, actually try to, to honestly participate in the game. And if you're like, even though Donald Trump's the best, F you, I'm not going to um, vote for Donald Trump, I'm going to vote for another person. Well, you're not really playing the game fairly, but let's not get ahead of ourselves here. The, main, the reason isn't that they voted for Joe Biden. That's not the reason the vote is um, not qualified. The, it's the reason that they have to vote. Meaning if they're like, hey, you know what? I really think Joe Biden should be the president then, okay, well, that's a different story. And you might be like, well, wait a minute, that sounds like a silly answer, like people could lie and all these kind of things. And like, yes, that's a, that's a whole other challenge, though. But the, within the spirit of the game of who's going to decide a presidency, who's going to decide a vice president, who's going to decide a senator, a representative, the main question is, at least with respect to voting, is are you in, acting in good faith? Are you genuinely trying to pick the best person for the job? And if the answer is, well, kind of, because I don't necessarily like the best candidate, 
and the re your reason that you have in your mind, okay, it's called mens re, or um, actually mens re is guilty mind, but mens is refers to mind. If the thing in your mind is, I don't like the, the candidate that I, th I know in my heart to be the best, so I'm gonna choose somebody that else, then you're not acting in good faith, you're acting in bad faith. When you believe something in your heart and that's not what you're saying with your mouth, that is bad faith. It's the definition of bad faith. In m any other situation, we'd call it cheating. Okay? So um, I'm going to go ahead and leave it at that. That's what qualified voting is. Qualified voting is one of, um, is one of the most powerful concepts I have ever discovered. When I was researching this book and was trying to figure out, you know, how do we actually do this properly, the thing that... Um, you know, I discovered and came to was that, uh, oh, didn't show my headline here, is that the, um, that qualified voting is very important. Okay, so before I go, I want to t pull up, let me see if I can do it. I think I got till nine o'clock, so I'm going to be pushing it here. Um, yeah, I do. Okay. So where can you learn more about this? Well, the rule of law is what we're talking about here. The rule of law is not just we're going to apply the same equal and garbage laws of equally to all people, which is what the cabal wants you to think about. The rule of law is something much more beautiful. And the rule of law can be understood in this book right here. It's called Maxims of Law. Lex, uh, oh, sorry, this is sovereign law. Let me pull up Maxims of Law. Positive law here. Bingo. There it is. I've actually been posting the wrong one this whole time. That's okay. Uh, hopefully, anybody, if you're watching this video, just click on this thing called Eucadia and then select Positive Law. So this book, it's an epic, amazing book. It's 400, 563 pages, and it details with one of the most clear and coherent models I've ever seen what the true rule of law actually is. And that's where I learned a lot of this stuff. Um, but I also learned it you know, through my own processes of intrinsic thinking and critical thinking and all these kind of things. So I would say if you're really interested in this, I'm going to pop the link in the chat and you can learn about that. I'm going to go ahead and we're going to switch over to the chat for a moment and grab some of these beautiful and wonderful Rumble rants. So first one here we have one from, I'm sure there's a lot of amazing comments and I apologize if I didn't get to one of your questions. If you ever have a question, please put it in all caps. I'll try to, to look through it. I tried to get through a lot of material. Surprise, surprise on my own here. Okay, so uh, this is Sammy. Sammy, thank you so much for your support. Truly, I know how, you know what's going on and I really, I'm very touched by that level of support. So I really appreciate it, all right? Thank you so much. He says, great topic, great explanation, great research, great show. Thank you so much, Sammy. I really appreciate it. And let's see, we got another one here. Oh, I can probably just click on this thing right here. Go on. Uh, teams, team smooth, smooth. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but where we go, that, that works probably. Great structure and journey. Thank you, Justin. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, let me know, guys, if that none of this, if it was not... If it was hard to follow, I would really appreciate the feedback because, like I said, I'm writing a book about this stuff. And my goal is to put this in the easiest form to understand possible within reason. And, um, you know, to give us the, this tools because the Founding Fathers discovered this a long ago. And there are other people that discovered it. The Carolingians discovered it in the 800s. Um, a, a lot of other people have discovered it. Many people, not just um, those awful white Europeans. Although I don't believe that garbage, of course. So with that, let's see. And we're going to do the final sponsor here. And that is Badlands itself. So hold on one second. There we go. I'll pull this up. I'll uh, do this one. Bada bing. All right, Badlands Media. Okay, so, oh, look, there's a show playing. It's mine. Um, let's see, where can I get, there it is, my computer's waking up for a second here. Okay, welcome to the Badlands Media Shop. We've partnered with Patriot Companies to offer products for just about every category of life. 
Browse the virtual shopping aisles and rest assured knowing that your purchases align with your values. Shop with peace of mind, avoiding woke companies with woke principles while supporting your favorite podcasters. Whether you're shopping for everyday household items or a unique gift for that special someone, skip the big box store, head over to the Badlands shop first and support a Patriot business and Badlands media with every purchase. From boomerangs, yes, those boomerangs, to gun holsters, from children's books to pet food. We have just about everything, and, we've just, and we're just getting started. Thank you, Badlanders, for your continued support and patriotism. We couldn't do this without you. All right, everybody, so there you have it. Um, thank you so much for watching and supporting Badlands Media. Thank you for our sponsors. We had No Bugs Beef. We had, uh, let's see. We got No Bugs Beef. We got River BTC. Get yourself some Bitcoin. We got Radio Ready. Get yourself some radios to help support uh, or to deal with any crises while your families are going through any issues. And Badland Shop. And also, guys, I'll just mention because I, I work for Ascent, so full disclosure, you should really check out some of the stuff in Ascent. I, they are one of our biggest sponsors here at Badlands, and I've had the pleasure of getting to know Lance and some of the products, and he... He really cares about creating great products, and he actually really cares about putting good quality stuff in these products. Like, to be honest with you, some of the best in the industry. I didn't, you know, people say that, and you're like, yeah, right, whatever. But, like, he's got the receipts to back it up, so it's pretty awesome. Definitely check out Bad uh, Ascent Nutrition, Go Ascent Nutrition, and we're having um, a promotion right now for Pine Pollen Tincture, which I'll tell you about at some point in the future. But for now, thank you so much, everybody. Much love. I really appreciate it. You stay vigilant, stay based, and I'll see you on Vigilant News Monday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Much love and take care.